Uh, great to see you all today. Uh, happy Father's Day for those of you who are fathers. Uh, it's a pleasure that you are actually here today and uh, spend your time with me and uh, with this team instead. So uh, <clears throat> with that, I'll, since I'm the first speaker today, I want to give you a little bit of an overview of why we're doing this, right? Not To not just jump into the, the technology right away. So as opposed to maybe uh, what, what most people are familiar with is, is often taxis, robot taxis, uh, but really autonomous trucking is the only answer to one of the world's biggest economic problems. So why is that? And, and what is that problem? Uh, we have a very large and growing freight demand. So two thirds of all things that are being shipped or that, that are really being used have been in a truck at some point. In most of the states in, you, in the US, uh, trucking is, uh, being a trucker is actually the number one job uh, that is out there. However, because we all want our goods to be shipped to our door and we, we want more and more of it, right? Uh, trucking really can't keep up with this. So, <clears throat> Younger people really don't want to get into long haul trucking anymore. Uh, a lot of them don't want to do that and be away from their families uh, for extended periods of time. So there's really a problem with actually keeping up uh, with this workforce. What people do want to do, though, is, is to have local trucking jobs, right? That's something that they would absolutely do. And so at the moment, we're missing about 80,000 uh, truckers in the United States, and uh, it's projected by the Trucking Industry Association to be 160,000. There's also a huge turnover. So when you see 89% turnover, 100% would mean that the enter company leaves and, and new fresh people start within one year, right? So it is very, very high, the turnover. So how can autonomous trucking help with this? Uh, in, in traditional trucking, you can only drive seven hours a day. Uh, like you, can, you can actually drive 11 hours, but on average, people drive seven hours. Versus with our Kodiak driver, our autonomous trucking technology, you could um, uh, drive up to 24 seven. You have to still refuel. You have to actually uh, maintain the truck. You have to do pre-trip inspections. It's what it's called. Uh, but still, you can drive actually quite a bit. Uh, you have preventable accidents. That's very similar to what we usually talk about for uh, passenger vehicles. Uh, over 90% of the crashes are caused by uh, human error. And especially on long haul routes, our truckers are really, really good, right? Very little, actually less than in passenger cars uh, happens there. But when something happens, it's pretty severe. And it's, uh, for me, easy to imagine that over uh, an 11 hour workday, I can actually, I could fall asleep. So uh, the Kodiak driver is built to have safety first and to always pay attention. So that's really the, the big benefit that we have here. But then also uh, for our environment in terms of emissions, uh, fuel cost is really uh, high there. And it's, the, uh, it's also creating significant emissions there versus with autonomous trucks, we can use uh, various different other technologies. And even today we see actually fuel savings of about 10%. So how are we going to roll this out? The Kodiak driver is really as an acid light solution. So you see here the first uh, mile or the, the, the first leg and the last leg and a, a very long. So this is not up to scale. The long haul is way longer, right? Uh, comparably. So you, you can drive many, many hours here from one city to another. We, for instance, uh, do Dallas to Atlanta every day. That's about 16 hours uh, where, where you drive there. And we do this 24-6 uh, today. So a human driver picks up the load, gets it to a transfer point, a, a truck stop, uh, and uh, some, sometimes, uh, yeah, de delivers it there and, and transfers the load. We sometimes call them truck ports. Uh, and then it goes fully empty, so completely driverless, no one in the cabin uh, in this long haul, uh, in this long haul stretch. And then the same happens again, a human picks it up and delivers the load. Uh, and today at Kodiak, we're not just testing. Kodiak actually has the most extensive AV network uh, that I'm aware of of any AV company. So uh, we also deliver more than 50 uh, paid AV loads. So this is not manually driven loads. These are 50 loads that we get paid for that are fully driven in AV, still with a safety driver, uh, but per week. 
So we run for some of the nation's largest uh, shippers and carriers. You see, for instance, IKEA uh, is one of our customers. We have a long-term contract with them. And some of the others like Werner or Sierra England. Sierra England, you might see if you're in California quite a bit, they have about uh, 5,000 refrigerated trucks. So uh, uh, Tyson, a big uh, chicken and meat producer that we uh, deliver for. Uh, and the network really spans coast to coast. So now, what, what do we do there? What, is, what do we experience there usually? Uh, common and corner cases, right? Day or night, uh, rain or shine. We drive in, in all weather conditions. Now, as you all know, it's not working the same in all weather conditions yet, uh, but uh, we actually, our system can handle uh, all of those. And you see some uh, on the top right, there's a house passing us. Uh, we often see windmill blades. I think any AV company that does trucking in Texas knows this one person in Texas who walks their dog along the highway every day. Uh, so you see a very special thing. We saw people riding horses across the highway, right? Like you, you get to see a lot of things. So it's not just following the road. You actually need in an AV system to handle all of these things. We also, of course, need to connect to these truck ports. Uh, so you see that on the, on the lower right uh, where we go off highway. Uh, and of course, we, we do all of this day and night, like I said. So how were we able to actually get there in a very uh, short time? Uh, Kodiak has been founded in 2018. And uh, we have designed our system from the very beginning to, uh, to drive like a human and especially also to localize like a human. So this scale of network is only possible. Uh, and I'll tell you one more thing. We built this enters, this network that I just showed before, not with hundreds of labelers annotating HD maps. We built it with three people. Three people were, is our map operations team. And uh, we, that's because it is designed to localize like a human. If you look at this picture here, what we as humans do is we look at, well, we, we don't look uh, what is the bridge over there doing and like the little, uh, the, the hill on the right side and very exactly the trees and where it's the sign. That's what you would put in an HD map, right? You would put all of these things in there, but that's not how we drive as humans. What we look at is where are the lane lines? Where's the road boundary, right? How does it, how does the curvature look ahead? so that I can actually slow down or go at uh, all the way at the speed limit. And so we, we, from the beginning, we said, let's only pack the things that on, on the one hand we can estimate online, but also that are really needed into our maps. And so that really lets us build these maps very fast and cheap. And it's also, in our opinion, the safest technology because rather than being correct to that sign or to that hill on the side, our tracks actually keep within the lane lines. Right, and that is that is much more important than knowing exactly where the bridge is and having centimeter accuracy and localization to that. So it allows us because it's so little information. It allows us to update our entry map in real time, and uh, it is very cheap to scale. So uh, if if we look at what we can do with uh, that. Uh, uh, you might say like, ah, oh, that's just a, a research prototype, right? You can't actually get this to work safely enough. Uh, here you see an example of us taking actually the driver out on a test track and uh, the, the truck driving completely uh, on its own, um, keeping the lanes very nicely there. Uh, and, and we, of course, go and I'll talk about this a little later. We go and stress test that a lot. But you can see that we were able to build, really build a full safety case for this already um, for our test tracks. And um, if you, if you want to know a little more about this, uh, actually, when we posted this a couple of weeks back, someone reposted it on Reddit. And uh, you know how Reddit users are, right? Someone said like, oh, this is so 2012, right? Like it just keeps the lane. Uh, but if you actually know what goes into a system like this, there's an enormous amount of, of fault monitoring. And I'm giving a talk about this tomorrow. So if you're interested in the embedded vision workshop, what actually goes into a test like this? How are you... Uh, making sure that uh, you can guarantee that this will succeed, right? There's no one in the in the truck anymore, and you drive a, a full-sized heavy truck at 65 miles an hour. You want to be absolutely sure that uh, you're not actually going to hit something. So there's a lot of preparation that goes into this, a lot of system safety case. Uh, so how do we do this? 
So on the perception side, we actually have uh, a couple of uh, networks that we run. Uh, we run one for drivable interiors that's mainly coming from the camera data. We run networks and camera and LiDAR for road and lane edges. So what you have seen in the picture just before, we actually detect where are the lane lines. Sometimes there are no lane lines. So how do we do it as humans? If there are no lane lines, well, we actually know where the road edges are and we can infer how many lanes were there before, right? There is, there is quite a bit uh, of knowledge you can put in this. You also want to have a ground estimate because sometimes trucks, for instance, they drive through clover leaves. They, a clover leaf is essentially an, an interchange at a, uh, at, at a larger highway crossing or two highways cross. Uh, and then, you also want to know well, where should I be driving? Sometimes lanes are really wide uh, and you want uh, a nominal path prediction there as well. So if we put all of this together with our road prior, uh, here on the, uh, in the middle left, you actually see a little, how does our map look like? It is actually pretty basic. It is it's just uh, lane lines uh, and, and road boundaries. And uh, you actually can create, we can create this um, with an onboard, with the onboard ML, algorithms uh, with a human in the loop when we create it. But then we have this prior and we use our local pose estimates and the perceived data. We all fuse it together and we create both a routable uh, road network. So we can use our map to say, well, what's coming ahead? Should I actually lane change already so that I can take the exit um, or not? Uh, I also get a local corridor. So the, uh, it tells me where should I drive? And that is really what I need. I, in the end, I don't care where the lane lines are. These are very inspired by the lane lines, but really I need to know where can I drive both nominally, but also in any uh, evasive maneuvers, for instance. If I wanna avoid last second, the vehicle in front of me, is there a space for me to go on the right side or should I go to the left, right? So how does this look in practice if we actually run it? This is, this is more uh, now our data where you see the output of all of these modules. Uh, you have a drivable surface, you have all the, the perception objects around us. Uh, you have these, these lane lines, you see the different colors, maybe a little um, of, of what is estimated and what, uh, here you see the little, what the, what the map says and what is estimated. And of course, over time that fits pretty well, right? But even if there is a change, uh, it does, it, we can we can actually handle those changes. So I would summarize this as actually what a lot of people say. Um, a lot of people say, well, we use maps as a sensor, right? And I haven't seen that to be true in too many cases. Uh, in a lot of cases, people actually trust their maps, right? They don't really use it like a sensor that could be wrong. And in our system, uh, really, I would say to summarize what we're doing, we actually use it like a sensor. So uh, they're truly, the, the map is truly a prior. Uh, it's not a crutch that we just lean on and, and use from the beginning and, and trust. And uh, what, what we actually think is the map is not necessarily correct, right? Very important. Uh, the map is not necessarily complete. Uh, so we often see vehicles, I already told you about the horses, right? If I would filter out everything that is outside of my map, I would never be able to predict that horse to cross my, my highway. Uh, but we are because we, we see the map as something that is a prior where people should be driving, but anything else is erratic. And so we still need to be safe in those instances. And finally, a detailed map is not necessarily available. We have recently extended from commercial trucking to also uh, help in, in the national security space here in the United States. And in a lot of cases for, for the military, actually autonomy in new environments is very critical, right? And that's where our, uh, our approach really scales very well. You see here a, uh, essentially a dirt road on the right side where the map is really, really basic. Yeah, we have mapped an intersection in this case, but really the, the map is very basic. And again, don't let your, yourself be fooled by how simple it is. It doesn't mean you can only follow exactly this lane, right? Uh, we, and I'll show you this in a second. So uh, it unlocks completely new use cases. Here you see someone actually in the field create a new map for us. So we can create this map on a handheld device. And now we already have a map like the one that I just showed you on the picture before, right? It has probably the wrong width. It has a, uh, a, an approximate width of that um, route, but it tells me roughly where do I wanna go? I wanna go from point A to point B. Now you might say like, well, but, Andy, this is not this is not very accurate, right? It's it's very uh, it, it's a very rough map, and that's true. So what we do is so this is a low fidelity prior, 
Again, we're using those as a prior. We basically want to know where should we go. And so we run dynamic map refinement using our onboard perception. We just, I just showed you the drivable surface, the road boundary detections, uh, the, the surface uh, estimation. All of that runs on all of our vehicles in real time. And uh, we can, uh, therefore, here on the left side, you see what the person just before uh, kind of was indicating as a path. And yeah, it's not quite fitting very well, right? It's actually a little off. But we know that uh, if there's there's like some other uh, part over here, we shouldn't go over there, right? It gives you a rough indicator of where did the person actually want to go. And uh, this refined smooth map then fits uh, and is actually drivable. So if we look at how does this work, uh, how does this work? Uh, we are actually now able with the exact same technology uh, to drive off-road. And by off-road, I mean the secondary roads, right? Dirt roads, uh, things that you can actually nicely see uh, and, and follow in this case. And uh, this is, again, uh, we didn't build a completely new stack for this. It is actually using the same technology, but everything that you have seen so far has no HD maps. So uh, how, do we, how do we get there and how do we actually make this very robust? So we're running closed loop simulation with a digital twin of, of these environments as well. And uh, our first step always is to go to simulation, right? We, we run simulations there, we discover edge cases very quickly and it enables us to do very rapid uh, development. What you see here on the right side is actually uh, a, a scene where we were adjusting the lighting uh, to be very similar. Like sometimes you see uh, tree shadows, you actually lose your detection. Sometimes you have hard and challenging conditions for your cameras. And so we can simulate a lot of that. It doesn't quite matter that it doesn't look like, in this case, the scene I just showed you, right? It's, it's the effect that matters. Uh, and we can simulate various different effects there to say like, well, would it still work in these cases and to inject those faults? So we run thousands of uh, scenarios every day, both on fully synthetic closed loop data, but also uh, open loop with our uh, perceived data that we collect on the vehicles. And that a few weeks later, after I showed you this first video, uh, we have now very robust off-board localization because we hardened the system that way, right? You can see us drive here over a single lane bridges and you can see how the truck actually shakes because it's such a bumpy road. Uh, yeah, we, we actually do all of this at night uh, we have various different tray lighting, just similar to what you have just seen in the simulated example. And also these intersections on the bottom right, right, is what I just talked about before. If you just were like, I follow the road, if you had a, an algorithm like this, you wouldn't know where to go. So really what, what our maps also give you is the intent. Uh, do I want to take the left or do I want to give, give, take the right at these intersections? Uh, and therefore I can drive uh, in these environments. So. Uh, maybe maybe to, to wrap it up. So why isn't everyone uh, doing this? Well, first, uh, it really, when we started this work in 2018, it hadn't really been done, right? So uh, it was a bet that this localization method would work. And it, was, it would have been way easier, and I think that's why a lot of, of research labs actually do this, would have been way easier to just take an existing HD map and localize on it and go with it, right? We actually chose not to do this because of our experience in the field and having seen that uh, this often does not work out very well. The other thing you need really is to have a very good real-time onboard perception and redundancy across sensors. Because if you lose one of your sensors uh, or if you just rely on uh, a single camera for something, it's very hard to actually make this work. Uh, but yeah, HD maps have this very low entry bar, but they're, they're much more painful to scale, uh, to, to actually maintain when you're scaling up. If you would maintain uh, an HD map for the the huge road network that I showed you in the beginning, it would actually take a lot of people and cost a lot of money. And finally, your system architecture needs to support it. So what do I mean uh, by this? Again, from the beginning, we actually took into account that there's uncertainty in everything we do. And you see this on the right side. This is, happens to be the output of one of our particle filters uh, that does the localization. And you can see that, well, we, we don't always know exactly where we are longitudinally, right? But it doesn't matter. It, as a human, when we drive there, we also don't know exactly where we are to the centimeter along a highway, right? Uh, we don't know exactly along this trail that I just showed you. And uh, we, we actually wanna, uh, wanna still be able to drive there well. So 
your entry system needs to support this. You can't make any assumptions anywhere that you know to the centimeter where you are. So that said, all of this is really built on your shoulders. So please keep researching the fundamental and also applied topics. We benefit a lot, especially in the second point, very good real-time uh, perception, right? We benefit from all of your work uh, that you do in research and uh, we value that a lot. Thanks a lot. <laughs>